Hi, Misha here, and it's the dog days of summer, unrelenting heat, good old August, not really a whole lot going on, because you know why in the gun world, and so I've been kind of doing collection overviews, because people have asked, did one on Romanian AKs, and did one on Yugoslavian, Serbian AKs, and felt like, why not do one on my existing Russian AK types. Now this is going to be just on the standard rifles and LMGs not the specialist guns just because there's already plenty to talk about. But it means I can always do another video on things like the Vithyaz or the AKSU. <laughs> but as I've been doing we'll start off kind of pre Kalashnikov talking about Russia's early interest in self-loading and select fire guns with the SVT-40 and the AVT-40, the Tokarev, 762 by 54 and then one of the early 762-39 guns, the SKS, and then we'll move on to the original milled AK the Type 3, often called the AK-47. This is a Type 3. I apologize, I don't have a Type 1 or Type 2 because they are crazy money. Which is funny because once the parts kits back 20 years ago were pretty reasonable, but back then you couldn't get receivers, especially for the Type 1, and that was pre-rewelding. Oh wow. We can still talk about the first generations. And then and this is a PLL kit build. And then we have my Legion AKM here, also in 7.62x39. This is a 70s production Izhesk. Then jump over to the 5.45. And I'm cheating here a bit with my SLR 105. But hey, some people say things like the trendings in these were actually Russian anyway, so. We'll go with that. Hey, it has Russian wood on it. And kind of a similar thing with my SLR 104FR here to represent the AKS-74. Hey, it's got Russian plum in the Russian side folding stock. And then wrapping up the rifles, we have the SGL-3194, of course, because we have to, representing the AK-74M. So we'll talk about the differences between all of these. And then, of course, I can't not talk about RPKs because I love me some RPKs. I have two guns from Legion here, an RPK and an RPKS. One a very early production kit, another one a 70s. Both of these in 7.62x39. And then two more, both of these in 5.45x39. One... RPK 74 kit build and of course to wrap it all up with my uh, Fime group RPK 7433 Again just something to hang out with for the weekend during these long hot summer days and nights I wish we had new stuff to really show and talk about but we just don't so, I'm just trying to keep things interested. And uh, feel free to talk about your own Russian clone guns or imports or builds or what you'd like to do or see in the future. We can just kind of talk about how fun it is to do such clones. So, with that, why don't we get started with the pre AKs and talk about how this guy came to be. Well, as I've been doing with these videos, we'll kind of start with the beginning, or rather before the beginning for the Kalashnikov automatic rifle. Russia had been pretty interested, Reed Stalin had been quite interested in select fire automatic rifles for a long time. It really began with the 1916 Fedorov, but it wasn't a terrible success but it did pave the way. 
Now I've done a whole video on the history of the SVT-40, the self-loading rifle Tokarev from 1940, and also on the SKS-45, the Semenov self-loading rifle of 1945. But just to kind of give some context for the Kalashnikov steps in, the SVT-40 is the improved model. It dates back to the Simonov AVS-36, which was a select fire rifle produced in pretty limited numbers in the 1930s, firing 7.62x54 rimmed. But unfortunately, it um, had some issues, mostly the fact that it was a select fire rifle firing 7.62x54 rimmed. It was used in the Finnish Winter War, and shortcomings were well known. And there was a bunch of back and forth between Tokarev and Simonov. And at this time, the Tokarev design was winning out with the SVT-38, which, no, I don't have one because, yeah, they're not common. But by the summer of 1940, Tula began producing the improved SVT-40. And later that year, Ishesk would join, and Padosk would become the third major manufacturer. And so these were in production. And the major differences between the SVT-38 and SVT-40 were the 40 was streamlined for production, relocated cleaning rod, one thing of interest, it had a uh, lockable mag catch because they had problems early on with soldiers accidentally releasing their magazines. It did have a 10 round attaching mag and typically three were issued per soldier. And it fired 762 by 54 rimmed just as the AVS 36 had before it. And uh, they would produce over 100,000 in the first year, and by the end of the second year, 1941, they would produce a million, but of course, Operation Barbarossa changed a lot of things. So by 1942, Ishesk had been ordered to halt SVT-40 production, and uh, Tula had been relocated, but did start up production again in the summer of that year, and managed to turn out over a quarter of a million by the end of 1942. And the reason production was scaled back was kind of twofold. One, the good old Mosin 9130 was simply cheaper and faster to mass produce. And also soldiers just tended to prefer it better because it's a conscript army. Interestingly, a lot of SVTs captured by both the Finnish troops and the Germans were rather well, well liked but they tended to have a little bit better training. But it was a more complicated gun, and one of its things, it was designed to be as lightweight as possible, only about nine pounds, and that's firing this rather large cartridge. But the concept is there, and it's about 48 inches long with this big muzzle brake. They did try doing sniper rifles, but these are disappointing, so the only built under 52,000. This one here is kind of interesting because it shows the AVT-40, which was a emergency select fire version they tried out. And the middle was safe. The left would have been semi-auto. And then flipping it all the way to the other side on the right would have been full auto. While they did eventually introduce a reinforced stock, at the same time they also went to a simplified muzzle brake, which was a little less effective than the original fishgill one. Long story short, you can imagine that a select fire Tokarev rifle was not great, so much though that by 1943 soldiers were ordered only to use the select fire when and if ordered to do so directly. And the gun was quickly taken out of production. And while they would continue to make Tokarev rifles through 1943 and 1944, production was slowed and it officially discontinued in January of 1945. And they only built about 1,600,000. And the reason that's quite small, initially Stalin wanted 
two million of these built a month. So it was a bit of a successful failure, or a failed success, because it did do as designed, but it really wasn't the best rifle for Russia in World War II. However, it did show their desire for both a self-loading rifle and a select fire one, but it finally kind of drove home the point that they really should have learned earlier that uh, 762-54 rimmed was just not great for an automatic gun, and also if you wanted a lightweight gun, it wasn't the right choice. But it did lead the way in other things. Short stroke gas piston, tilting bolt, detaching mag, and they learned several ways to produce reasonably effectively, reasonably cheaply, a um, self-loading rifle. This one here is a so-called Bulgarian light refurb, so it's more or less an original World War II styling. And they did make some shortcuts and changes to production throughout the World War II, but by 1943, Tokarev's star was on the decline once again with Stalin, and trials were starting to be held for a new rifle actually a new rifle family to fire a new cartridge, an intermediate cartridge 7.62 by 41 although as you probably know it today, 7.62 by 39 and that's where Semenov's self-loading carbine the SKS comes into play one reason the SVT and Mosin Nagant were pretty heavily relied upon, as well as the PPSH-41 in 1942, was just Russia's position in the war. It was still very much a defensive war, and while the, Rus the German advance had been stalled out, there were still major battles to be fought, including freeing Leningrad and the Battle of Kursk. By 1943, though, the tide was beginning to turn, and America was getting more involved in the European war. This gave Russia time to do some research and look into new designs. Like many nations, they conducted studies about the range and effectiveness in combat and concluded that rounds like the 762 by 54 rimmed were simply overpowered because combat was taking place between 100 meters and 300 meters or less. Longer range shots were just not that common. And so they were one of the first adopters of a intermediate cartridge. Now, you could be, you you, you could say that the American M1 carbine, 7.62 by 33, was an early intermediate cartridge. It it's, it's verging between that and a pistol round. But of course, the most famous early user would have been Nazi Germany with eight mm Kurs, 7.2. 92 by 33. And obviously Russia got wind of this and it captured some of the rounds and developed the 7.62 by 41 millimeter cartridge. And in 1943 they announced a new round of trials to fire this and they would have a whole family of guns. They wanted four guns to fire the new cartridge. A traditional bolt action, an automatic select fire rifle, kind of analogous to the MP-43, excuse me, or MKB-42, if you go there. They also wanted a light machine gun, and they wanted a semi-automatic self-loading carbine. And Simonov, who initially had kind of had success with the AVS-36, but then had been kind of shut out with the Tokarev SVT-38 and SVT-40, was starting to enjoy favor with Stalin again. He admitted in 1939 that his original AVS-36 design needed work, and he had an improved variant ready by 1940. 1941 rolls around, and Stalin is losing patience with Tokarev, and there's a planned series of trials that summer, around July, for carbine models. Guns like the SVT-40 were full-length rifles, 
with roughly 24 inch barrels. Well there was the SKT-40 carbine and Simonov at the time had a new version called the SKS-41 and this it still fired the 762x54 rammed cartridge and these were probably going to go up against each other but then the Germans so yeah then because of needs of war Simonov Simonov would take his design and turn it into the upscaled PTRS-41 anti-tank rifle a two-man kind of small crew served weapon this was well liked by the troops in Stalin so by 1942-43, he was in a good position. He was gaining favor, and Tokarev was on the way out. He looked at the new trials for the 760 41mm cartridge and decided he wanted to work on the carbine, the self-loading carbine. And basically, he went back to his traditional design, scaled it down for the new cartridge, and submitted it. Now, one thing you'll note, the SVT-40 along with other early designs, had a detaching mag. Well, one thing Stalin decided for the new carbine was it was going to have a fixed magazine because he was tired of soldiers dropping them, losing them, and he thought producing three mags per gun was inefficient. His idea was having a fixed mag that could be charged off by stripper clips or chargers was a more effective design. Okay, fine. To cut a long story short, the Tokar of design was selected, and a pre-production batch was made at Tula and first deployed for field testing on the Belarusian front at the end of 1944, and more were used during the charge on Berlin in 1945. And right as the Great Patriotic War was ending that spring, the Simonov design was adopted as the SKS-45. However, Post-World War II, Russia didn't need new guns. It needed to rebuild. So designs like this were just shelved for a long time. Now the SKS would finally go into production in Russia towards the end of 1949. And it would end up being kind of a uh, insurance against the failure of the AK Type II. Because the original AK Type 1, AK 47, had uh, suffered quite a bit of failures and uh, setbacks. So by 1949, they weren't sure if it was really going to work out. So they put the tried and tested, very refined SKS into production at Tula. They would also put it in production at Ishask in 1953. But as we know, the AK did work out. So truly, the, the, the design was pretty well obsolete in Russia right as it was going into service. Nevertheless, they would build these in quite large numbers, couple, several millions, but production would only be at Ishesk throughout 1954, and it would end at Tula between 1956 and 1958, depending on who you ask. Where the SKS really became popular was being exported to friendly communist nations and being manufactured in places like China. So even though Russia didn't make all that many, it's been estimated that 15 million plus have been made in the world. So it ended up being quite an influential design, even though maybe not in Russian service because it was the backup. And uh, that's kind of why it's in all these long videos I do looking at all the nations, because most of them did use some variant. This one here is an early 1950 production. It's not the earliest 1949 style because it has the blade bayonet, not the uh, spike. Now what's interesting about this one, it has the blade bayonet with the blued finish. This isn't a refurb bayonet. This is the early styling. When they had the spike, they gave it a black finish, a blued finish, and then they went to a black blue blade and then they would go to the polished silver blade and then more of a matte pewter blade during refurbishment. It also has the early style gas block and it has a non chrome lined 20 and a half inch barrel and early guns like this had spring loaded firing pins and a few other interesting features but a lot of this stuff was kind of stopped to cheapen production. In 
And so, yeah, early Vaunt guns like this are kind of interesting just for the features that they had. These would be used in Russian frontline service throughout the 50s and then be in kind of reserve second line and ceremonial parade service throughout the 60s. But really, it's just what paved the way for the AK. Unlike the AK, this is still a short stroke gas piston with a tilting or tipping bolt, not a rotating bolt. And again, it has a fixed 10 round mag that can be opened to drop the ammo, but it's still fixed in the gun. So, yeah. There we go. It's just, it's a wholly different system, really. Even though it has some similarities. Well, with that, let's move on to the main attraction. This is my AK Type 3. Actually, it's a transitional AK Type 3 with a few Type 2 elements still. You've seen this in several videos. This is a old PLO kit build on a uh, firing line receiver which was pretty much the receiver of choice 15 years ago but yeah and it has a early slab side 30 round mag the AK did have a rocky start and I've done a couple of full videos on the history, but as I mentioned, the 7.62 F41 cartridge, the specs were pretty much done by November of 43, and by 44, several designers were interested in making this. Now, whereas the SKS was to be a semi-automatic carbine, hello hobo, this was to be a select fire rifle, analogous to the MP43, MP44. And an early contender actually came from Sudayev, the designer of the PPS-42 and PPS-43. And he had a design, the AS-44, which was put into limited production, and Mikhail Kalashnikov was on his team as a junior member. But unfortunately, Sudayev passed away before the design could really be finalized. And Tokarev, too, made a design for the new cartridge, but it didn't go anywhere. By 1946, there was a new round of trials, and Kalashnikov now had his own design, which had a prototype name of AK-46. And it was kind of on the down select in November, December of 1946, but then did lose out in 1947 to other designs. But also that year, the Russians were switching from 7.62 41 to 7.6239. This was to improve feeding, to improve reliability, and to ease manufacturing full-scale production. And the designers were each allowed to rework their gun to fire the revamped cartridge. Well, Kalashnikov took this opportunity to really do more than that, including going to a fixed long-stroke gas piston now, as opposed to a short-stroke floating piston, as in the 46. This is also when the removable top cover and contained recoil spring came in and the AK safety. And these were all borrowed from either other prototypes or guns like the M1 Grand or even Remington Model 8. Long story short, by the end of 1947, Kalashnikov had four AK-47 prototypes. Three were fixed stock models. And one was an underfolder. And by 1948, his design was selected. Now, the other designs were actually more accurate, but his design was felt to be the most durable, dependable, reliable. And as you know, the earliest guns, the AK Type 1s, which were adopted and put into production in 1949, had an early stamped receiver. Kind of taking from the PBS 43. But projection rates were quite high. If the guns were successfully manufactured, they worked fine. But many were not many receivers, just the stampings didn't come out right. This is just because of the technology of the day. 
Therefore, in 1950, the Edershesk Arsenal, which is where these were made at, requested to go back to a milled receiver, which was approved, and production switched over in 1951 from the Type 1 to the Type 2 with a milled receiver. And then in 1953, the Type 3, with a few more refinements, would come about, which would be produced until 1959. And like I said, they would be transitional guns between Type 1 and 2, and then Type 2 to 3. And again, these are built at Ishesk, and would pretty much become the standard. Firing 762 by 39 having an overall length of about 34 and a quarter inches with a fixed stock. An underfolding stock version known as the AKS would, of course, also be adopted. 16 and a quarter inch barrel. Cold hammer forged at least later on. Chrome lined. True milled receiver. And a very heavy slab side stamped magazine. In fact, the early guns were pretty heavy at about 9.5 pounds with a mag in them. But they learned their lessons from the SVT-40 and whatnot being too light, so when they switched over here, they weren't so concerned. In fact, this has a pretty heavy profile barrel and was reasonably very successful. Not only were these exported, production would start up in foreign countries like China, and Bulgaria around 1956 and then a very short time later in places like Poland and East Germany and I think from there you know the history <laughs> it was uh, just one of the most successful possible but it was heavy not only were the mags nearly a pound each the pouch issued with them here was a five cell just picking it up it is not light. Luckily it does have a shoulder strap. And you'll notice the furniture doesn't have Russian red hues. That wasn't really something done with the AK Type 2 or Type 3. There's more of a honey blonde or brown color at the time. These would have a blued finish. And slab side handguards. This is an earlier slab side wood pistol grip. Later ones would be checkered. And uh, the buttstock has a pretty unique downward sweep to it with two tangs, one on the top with one screw and one on the bottom with two screws. Trap door in the butt stock for a cleaning toolkit. Non lightning cut bolt carrier. This has a type 2 very heavy duty top cover with milled recoil guide and of course it has a type 1 bayonet lug under the uh, front sight and it's threaded 14 millimeter no milled Russian AK-47s have ever been imported to semi-autos from Russia the best we can do are parts kits there have been a few milled guns come over like the Chinese Polytech Legends and the Bulgarian SA-93, but these are not exact Russian copy or clones. I put this mag in it. This is often called a Russian waffle or even paratrooper mag. This is an early attempt to help with the weight. It's a lightweight alloy mag that came about in the late 50s. And I'm not sure if it was ever officially fully adopted, although they didn't make a large number of them. This was just a way to get away from the really heavy and pretty expensive to build slab cider. In the end, though, they would end up selecting the stamped steel ribbed mag we're more familiar with, just because it was a little more durable, but still quite a bit lighter. And these were only made in Russia for a relatively brief period of time. They typically were issued in three round pouches, which are three mags in a pouch that's a lighter pouch, a belt pouch without the shoulder strap, all quite a bit lighter. Although they could be in the older five cell pouches as well. This uh, AK Type 2 or Type 3 
Anyway, the mill guns would be replaced in production in 1959 in Russia, although production would continue in other nations through the 60s. But uh, they wanted something a little bit lighter and a little more controllable in full auto, which kind of brings us to our next gun and our next generation. The AKM. The modernized rifle, the modified rifle, with the 1.0 millimeter stamped receiver, sometimes called the Type 4 receiver. And this is my build from Legion USA using an original Russian kit. The goal behind the AKM was to make production less expensive, streamline it for quicker production, to make the gun more controllable and full auto, and to uh, save weight. Efforts began as far back as 1954, and then in 1957, running through 58, there was a new round of trials. Tula and the Korov arsenals both submitted designs, new designs, and Ushesk submitted a modified Kalashnikov design, which in a lot of ways was a return to the Type 1 now that stamping technology was down. And in 1959, the Soviet Union selected the new Kalashnikov design for several reasons. It was familiar to troops, they already had a production line up and running, it was a known quantity. Overall length is still about 34 and a quarter inches with the muzzle device removed. More like nearly 35 with it on. Barrel length is still 16 and a quarter. But now we're quite a bit lighter weight. The AK-47, the AK Type 3, with the slab side mag was 9.5 pounds. The AKM, with its new magazine, was just under 7 pounds, about 6.9. As I said, they tried the waffle mag, but in the end they went to a thinner stamped steel mag with ribbing to make it stronger. The waffle mag was half the weight of the slab mag, this was more like three-fourths the weight, but again was as strong as the slab cider. And when you carry multiples, that adds up. And they still issued the five-cell and the three-cell pouch, but they also started issuing in the 60s a new four-cell pouch. Other weight savings, of course, were with the stamped receiver. They went to a thinner top cover, again ribbed for reinforcement. They also put lightning colt cuts in the bolt carrier and bolt. The uh, dimples around the magwell are actually there to give strength to the stamped receiver, not to really keep the mag from moving. The furniture was made lighter weight. By this time, a synthetic pistol grip is standard. And probably most important for weight, they went to a lighter profile barrel, still chrome-lined bore. And to help make it more controllable and automatic, they changed a few things. They went to a more straight-lined buttstock. And they added palm swells to the handguard for a better grip. And they made this sugar scoop style muzzle device standard which doesn't do a whole lot in semi-auto but in full auto for as small and compact and light as it is it does help with recoil they also changed the bayonet lug to the under the gas block where you're more familiar with it and moved the sling swivels around and internally on a full auto select fire gun they added the out of battery safety often known as the rate reducer. But these were officially adopted in 1959 and were put into production first at Ishesk and then quit soon Tula. 
and were built in Russia through at least 1977. 1968, a new way to save some weight was introduced when they went to a new synthetic reinforced fiberglass magazine that's often known today as just Bakelite. These were made at both Tula and Ishesk. And beginning in 1970 and running through 75, again first starting at Ishesk and then Tula, they started introducing more cast parts and stopped serializing many parts to save on production. For example, the rear trunnion started to be cast. The bolt carrier would be cast. The front gas block unit here would be cast, which is pretty noticeable. The front sight would be as well, the handguard retainer. But it's very important to note that the front trunnion was never cast, and the bolt itself was never cast. Also, on the original guns, the finish went from being blued on the AK-47 type to a phosphate finish covered by, at times, very gloopy paint. And furniture often went to laminated wood. Still a trapdoor in the buttstock, though. And the sling changed very little. Over 10 million of AKMs would be produced and the underfolding AKMS. If you've noticed, I don't really have a lot of the Russian folders just because I prefer fixed stockers. Personal preference. And I have plenty of other underfolders in other countries. Speaking of other countries, this, like I said, is a kit gun. It's on a children's receiver with an original matching Russian kit. And then it has a Cold Hammer Forge Chrome Line Barrel made by FB Radom. The reason I have a kit gun for my Russian AKM is that no imports have ever come in. The closest, if you want an import, would be a Egyptian Mahdi, followed by the Romanian SAR-1. Both are quite close to the original Russian, but still not Russian. And... Newer guns like the SGLs are not AKMs, so that's why I have what I have here. And Legion USA is an interesting company. I've done a couple of videos, including a pretty recent gun of the day on this. But, um, yeah, going to the new synthetic mag, this is about half the weight of the slab side, so it was only a fraction heavier than the original alloy waffle and had the durability of the others, so this became quite popular in the 1970s. Although for 7.62x39, really these were only made in Russia. Yes, I know China has a so-called Bakelite mag, but it's a totally different material. And they were made by both Ishesk and Tula. Production would officially end in 1977, but Russia would keep many AKM and AKMSs in service through the 80s, refurbishing them, keeping, reusing them. And even some are in service today, at least specialists in reserve. It was never officially declared obsolete. So there we have this. But let's backtrack a bit to the companion to the AK and AKM. Next up, the RPK, or Kalashnikov handheld machine gun, with the implication there of light machine gun, chambered for 762 by 39 and the RPK-S with the side-folding wood stock. Both of these are builds, again, from Legion USA, using Russian kits. They're on Nodak RPK receivers with chrome-lined U.S. barrels. Not my first choice, but again, we really don't have choices. If 
for early RPK types, is for imports. This dates back almost to the same time as the AKM. Around 1955, that's when they wanted a pairing of a light machine gun and assault rifle to be pretty much the same system. Previously, the RPD-44 had been the light machine gun firing the 7.62 by 39 cartridge, something that dated back to World War II and the SKS, and it was a belt fed with a 100 round belt in a drum container. But by the 50s, they wanted something more modern and reliable. The RPD was not the most reliable. So, Ishesk began work on basically upscaling the new AKM as they were designing to be the RPK. And this was adopted very shortly after the AKM. Work was at Ishesk, and then in 1960, the production was actually transferred to the factory we know today as Molot because the HS just didn't have the leftover capacity to make more guns and they are known still to this day for producing RPK variants. Now it's of course the same long stroke gas piston system with two lug rotating bolts as the AK. It has a 1.5 millimeter thick receiver, reinforced bulge front trunnion, Longer 23 and a quarter inch barrel, heavy profile, still threaded 14 by 1 left hand with a folding stamped bipod under the barrel, heavy duty handguard, windage and elevation adjustable rear sight. This is a 1961, so first year production kit, so it still has some AKM type features, including the ribbed top cover, but soon they would go to a smooth top cover as a standard feature. Early ones would have a wood pistol grip, but soon they would go to a synthetic. It had a club foot stock, which fit an AKM style rear trunnion, but it was based on the stock for the RPD, and it had a storage compartment. And it had a different sling, a little bit longer with a shoulder pad. It fed from a 75 round drum or a 40 round box mag. Originally they were the stamped rib steel, but beginning in the late 60s they too went to backlight, as we call it, fiberglass for saving weight. Typically the issue would either be one 75 round drum and one pouch of four 40 round mags, or later on, two pouches of eight 40 round mags in total and no drum. And while the fixed stock was the most common, the folder was made for paratroopers and other specialist units, and it's a unique folding mechanism. It folds to the left, and actually, once it's deployed, you have to use a bullet tip to fold it back because the idea was so that it would not accidentally fold up if you were doing full auto fire. And whereas the AK and AKM were primarily built to be fired in uh, semi-auto with full auto as just a reserve, the RPK was meant to be used more for short controlled bursts, light machine gun. It is of course longer at about 41 inches and the folding stock version is about 32 inches with the stock folded. And the fixed stock is about 10 and a half pounds, just a little more. The folder is about 11 pounds because of the extra mechanism. That might seem heavy, but the RPD that it replaced was uh, 16 pounds. And that, of course, was still quite a bit lighter than other light machine guns like the BAR. So it was considerably light for that day and time. And obviously, if you're going to talk about RPKs or anything like this, you have to show it with the bipod out. The drum was typically kept in its canvas bag. That's why I had an open top for easy use. Like I said, this is an early kit. 
one or another early feature is it doesn't have the lightning carrier and uh, lightning cut in the bolt carrier later ones would and early ones like this had the dimpled receiver above the magwell later they would get rid of that as it wasn't really necessary big long cleaning rod under the barrel yeah so these are going to production by 1961 and by 1964, they really started to see deployment to Soviet squads. The first time they were seen in the public, at least officially, was the May Day Parade in 1966, by which time they were really starting to replace the RPD. And production would last officially through at least 1978 to 1982, depending on your source, at Malat, for the basic 762 by 39 RPK. And uh, interestingly, the only nation really that made a one-to-one -one copy, at least licensed copy, was uh, Romania. In the Romanian guide I talked about, the PM-64, early on, they were exact copies of this, even down to the ribbed top cover initially. Other countries would purchase and issue Russian RPKs, of course, quite a bit. And some would make Kalashnikov-inspired light machine guns. For example, Yugoslavia with their M72. And Bulgaria with their milled receiver LMG. But neither of those was really an RPK, at least one-to-one. -one. And China, because of their relations with Russia by the 60s, never would receive a license to produce it. And so, what people consider to be Chinese RPKs are really just long barreled AKs with bipods. Kind of the same thing goes for what came out of Egypt. It was a specialist gun though, meant to be just one per squad to increase the firepower and slightly increase the range. And so it's not surprising that few nations actually produced these. But Russia sure did, and they still issue quite a few RPKs and RPKSs to this day. And here's the folder with the fiberglass, the Bakelite mag installed and the stock deployed and hobo mewing it actually uses a tang system top and bottom for the stock to fit into and you'd think this lever would actually release it but it doesn't you have to use a bullet tip on the opposite side in the hole to fold it again once it's out to deploy it, there's a lever inside, just like you'd expect on a Vepr. In the front, it's the same gun. And the RPKS really became famous in the Afghan war, where the user deployed quite a bit for mountain troops. And Russia was the only nation to manufacture this variant. Romania, they would have a paratrooper version, but it had a totally different, uh, different buttstock. So, yeah. <laughs> and again the reason I have kit builds versus just getting a Molot Vepr we'll get to it later in the video but the, the Vepr is based on a much newer version with differences for example in the folding mechanism and the way the barrel hardware is attached and the muzzle device and all that and Legion did a small run of these RPKSs because they're quite uncommon because many of them are still in use in Russia or have been sold, given away to Russian allies over the years. But yeah, they were produced at the, the Molot factory exclusively. And with that, let's move on to kind of the next generation of Russian guns. It's intermission with cats. Hello, hobo. Say hello, peanut.
Yeah, they don't do a whole lot. They mostly just sit here. Welcome to owning cats. And thus concludes Intermission with Cats. I guess we'll get back to guns now. And on to the 545 by 39 cartridge and the AK-74. And I'm cheating a bit with this one. The good news is we're away from kit guns. This is an import, of course, as you know. But it's officially an arsenal SLR 105A1 built in Bulgaria. However, for a long time many have claimed that when they assembled these back in 2004 they used leftover Russian parts such as the trunnion. So we'll go with that. I just decided it was better to have an import of high quality and then they try to mess with the kit build with the U.S. receiver and perhaps U.S. barrel. Personal decision there, but I do have Russian furniture on it. And we've got a Russian mag in it. So, the AK-74. It began with the cartridge, 545 by 39. As early as 1960... Russia was interested in what would become the M193 cartridge. And they did acquire some. And early experiments were basically a 7.62x39 casing necked down to fire a 22 caliber 223 type bullet. And this was to be a kind of a bimetal core, originally with a soft core and later with a harder, more penetrant core as body armor would come around. And by 66 or so they pretty much had the design nailed down and so they put out submissions to design a new rifle and light machine gun for that matter to fire it. By 1968 they pretty much had the basic 5, 4, 5 by 39 round figured out, and the earliest trials began. And several companies submitted design proposals, including some with the balancing bolt system. But in the end, yet again, a design from Ishes based on the Kalashnikov action was picked, known as the A3 initially. It was officially selected in early 1974, and then the cartridge was officially adopted that year as 7 and 6. And the reason they went with the AK style again, it wasn't the most accurate, and other designs were as reliable during testing, but it was a known quantity, soldiers were familiar with it, and it was about 50% parts compatible with the existing AKM, meaning the transition over would be pretty straightforward and simple. While the Kalashnikov name was used for it and he was kind of credited as supervisor, it's quite famous that he was not really a, in favor of the 545 round. So the day-to-day -day work was actually not done by him. The earliest kind of pre-production rifles were built beginning in 1973 and through 75 were built in small batches and a lot of these had early AKM features and then the first kind of production run was in 1976 where they built about a quarter million and they still had AKM features to some extent but by 1979 the rifle we know today really was taking shape and by 1980-1981 it was a full AK-74 and it really is roughly the same one good thing, they are able to make it a little bit lighter. It's now about a quarter pound lighter than the AKM. We go to the 90 degree gas block with accessory lug. We have a new front sight base with new location for a bayonet lug. 
with the very unique AK-74 brake on 24 millimeter threads. Early on they had a half moon style, then they went to this style around 1979 known as the zigzag type. They still had a palm swell handguard, although different shape. Still had a 1.0 millimeter stamped receiver. Still had the rib top cover. Early ones would still be using the Bakelite mags. The buttstock had ovular lightning cuts. Sure to save weight, but also to make it quick and easy to identify 5.45 guns versus 7.62, since they were similar. Early guns would have a rubber recoil pad, but pretty quick they would get rid of it. Still has a storage compartment in the stock as well. Mag pouches would be basically the same, either 3 or 4 cell. Now the strap would have two holes, one for 7.62 mags, one for 5.45 mags, as they were shorter and straighter. And flipping her over, pretty much the same side as the other. This doesn't have the accessory lug on it because it's an import, but you definitely know exactly where it would be. Pretty similar on this side. Now, the AK-74 was, was not a bad gun, but only about 5 million were made, so it was far less successful than the AK-47 or the AKM. Throughout the 1980s, they would find ways to speed up production, but only Russia, Bulgaria, and East Germany would really produce these under license. A few other countries would make 545 chambered guns like Poland, Romania, and China, but they were not based on the AK-74 per se. They were their own designs. So these were not made too much outside of Russia. And of course they first saw active combat in Afghanistan in the 1980s where they became quite famous, so much so that they even mocked them up from AKMs for the movie Red Dawn in 1982. But really it is just a reworked AKM for the most part, which is exactly what the Russians wanted. They were more interested in the new caliber than really changing up a proven system that they knew how to build and that worked fine. At least for the fixed stock. When it came to the AKS-74 folder, they were a bit more adventurous. And with this I really am cheating. This is an Arsenal SLR-104FR which is a much newer import than the 105. But it is the best example of an AKS-74 with the side folding stock we've, we've had. Again, I could do a kit build. It was my decision to go with the Arsenal. The front end is of course the same, but the rear is different. They went to this left side folding sheet steel buttstock made of metal, that it deploys very easily and securely. It has a much more comfortable cheek rest than the original AKMS underfolders. It was cheaper to build, locked more securely, and was actually slimmer and lighter weight. Funnily enough, the folding version of the AK-74 was slightly lighter than the fixed stock. <laughs> it was uh, under three kilograms, so under about six and a half pounds. Not a whole lot of weight savings difference, but some. And here you see the side rail. This was an optional feature at the time on the AK-74. Often it had the N added to the name. Typically these were for early night vision devices, although scopes could also be attached. Like I said, throughout the 1980s they did find ways to streamline production. They started going to a two-piece type muzzle brake. Also around 1985 they started going to new plum colored furniture. This was early synthetic 
It could either be purple, brown, or some mix. Mags had already started the transition in the early 80s. That's why some will be more of a shiny finish like this here. Others will be more matte finish later on. And you can find a mix of wood and synthetic on some guns as they were replaced. But uh, they were going to early types of synthetic. Quite a while back I did a full video on the whole plum situation. So if you're interested you can check out why plum. <laughs> In the 80s, too, they started going to a new pattern of mag pouch in Russia. Still a three cell, but a new material with kind of a leather border. And these were pretty much exclusively for the 545 cartridge. They're not really tall enough to comfortably accommodate 762. They have a kind of a rougher finish, too. I like them, though. They're interesting. Here it is on the other side. And this was actually a very popular folding stock model because the folding stock was as tight and nearly as comfortable as a fixed stock. So it didn't have a lot of the detractions that the AKMS, AKS 47 underfolders had. This one does have the accessory lug even though it's an import. A bayonet lug up here still has 24 mil threads but it does have the later style muzzle brake now the AKS 74 was really only made outside of Russia and Bulgaria around 1984-85 they adopted the AK 74 AKS 74 initially their guns were built with Russian supplied parts later they made their own but throughout production through the early 90s they still continued to receive parts from Russia from time to time so when you get Bulgarian kits in sometimes they will have this plum type furniture which is uniquely Russian in Bulgaria they used wood or later on black synthetic but the plum is Russian same goes for the mag says a to less star <laughs> But an interesting transition during the period in the 1980s. And again, saw quite a bit of use in Afghanistan. And of course, to go alongside, they had to adopt an RPK to fire the new cartridge, known, of course, as the RPK 74. Now, originally, these would have wood furniture. But soon they would go to the plum style here. Pretty much the same gun, 23 and a quarter heavy barrel. The real difference on the end is they went, they still kept the 14 millimeter threads, but now they've gone to a birdcage flash hider. And they've slightly redone the collar for the bipod to give it a little more rotation. Still has a windage elevation adjustable rear sight. Smooth top cover. This one has the optional rail. And uh, instead of a drum, these are issued with 45 round mags exclusively. Originally it would have been the Bakelite type. Then there would have been plum in the same rib pattern. I, I don't have any of the plum. So you get the black style. But this is a Russian mag. And they would issue two pouches of four mags each here. So a total of eight 40 rounders. Has two holes in it for the size of the mag. And this style does not have the forward compartment for an oiler or what have you. Still has the shoulder strap though. Now this gun was assembled from one of the RPK 74 kits that came into the country. But these were never imports. And the kits were marketed as Bulgarian. But more recent research has shown that they were actually just scrubbed and remarked Russian Molot kits. Which makes sense but considering how late Bulgaria actually adopted the 545 RPK here. So while they did issue them and even assemble them, they seem to have assembled most of them from Russian parts. And again, that's kind of 
borne out by the fact that many kids came in with the uh, plum furniture. And of course we have to show it on the bipod here. I have to wonder if one reason they went to the more of a angle on the collar. The 45 round mag is slightly longer than the 40 rounder of the AK X39 type, 762X39 RPK. Part of it is it doesn't have as much of a curve. The other one is that it's 45 rounds. So it definitely has more of a tendency to monopod unless you tilt it over. And much like with the RPKS, there was a RPKS 74 that had the same pattern of left side folding stock, be it wood or synthetic plum. And again, these were really only officially built in Russia and Bulgaria and only issued by a few other countries because at the time the RPK 74 was coming into service, most nations were falling out of favor with communism. <laughs> So 545 just didn't get as widespread. Of course, the RPK-74 was used in Afghanistan throughout the 80s. And is still considered current issue in the post-Soviet Russian army to this very day. Of course, many have been updated over the years. But all in all, the Mullet design really hasn't changed a whole lot. And again, there's never really been an import of these because, well, several reasons. The Vepr is close in some ways, but not in others. And the Bulgarian 545 guns that were sold briefly, known as the SARPK-3, were actually on a milled receiver and had a different uh, barrel profile. So, not really RPK-74s themselves. Well, we're hitting the home stretch now, and finally moving into the 21st century. And of course, ending with the two we always had to end on, the first, the SGL 3194, one I've voted at the very top of my AK list more than once over the years, one I'm very happy to, uh, to have, and one I never really thought we would... Uh, we would get imported into the USA. This is a semi-automatic version of a modern Russian army AK-74M. And frankly this is one of those guns that is often a little misunderstood. I think a lot of people just feel like you just put black furniture on an AK-74 and you have an AK-74M Likewise, put black furniture on the same type of gun, but chambered for 762 by 39 and you have a, a um, AK-103. Or, black furniture on a 5.56, and you get an AK-101. And that's not really true at all, because there's a lot of changes. These are the culmination of several updates done to the design throughout the late 80s and early and mid 90s and the entire AK Century series. Now the 101 and the 103 were pretty much designed for export although Russia has purchased a few AK 103s for its own use but primarily it has the AK 74M so yes, they did go to true black polymer furniture here. It's more of a nylon base. It has standardized the left side folding stock from the AKS-74, now going to a solid body unit. If I can push it here. There we go. With a cleaning kit compartment. Folds over. 
The scope rail is now a standard feature, not an optional one. And it has new true black 30 round mags. But there are other changes. Now I've done a full video comparing an AK-74 to an AK-74M, but just a few highlights. It has a new pattern of muzzle device, muzzle brake. It's on a longer collar, which was done to make it much tighter fitting for better uh, accuracy. Still has the bayonet lug under the front sight base, accessory lug under the gas block. They've simplified these a bit by removing some lightning cuts. Black polymer handguards with the heat shield. They've gone to a thicker, smooth top cover. They've gone to a new type of trigger guard. In fact, all the little small parts are different. For example, they have this so-called bump rivet up here on the uh, front trunnion, which was done to ease manufacturing and to also make the bolt lock and unlock more securely. In the back, they started adding a spring-loaded detent to lock the top cover on in case they needed to launch rifle grenades using an under-barrel launcher, actually using the accessory lug, as it were. And they went from a 4.5 millimeter stock pin to a 5.5 millimeter, and they slightly changed the angle cut at the back of the receiver. Flipping it over, we see a classic AK-74 lightning cut on the stock, also a secondary cut down here. We have a new pattern of safety. The bolt carrier group has actually changed a good bit, especially the piston, and so on and so forth. Again, if you do a part-by-part -part comparison, there are changes to virtually everything. Because this wasn't something that was just immediately made. It took them the better part of a decade to make all the changes. It was officially adopted in 1991, 1992, but the end of communism kind of delayed its full of service for a few years. And they didn't just pull out the older AK-74s and the AKS-74s, rather... As they wore out and they needed new guns, they started purchasing these from Ishes, which became Ishmash. And today is Kalashnikov Concern. Now, the reason I said I bought this SGL 3194, this is as close as you've ever had to an import for an AK-74M. There's only a few things that aren't correct on it. For example, not having the reinforcing plate over the pistol grip but many other things like the muzzle device you can put on to make it right and really the only other country besides Russia to make the AK-74M is Venezuela Bulgaria does not make and does not have the data package to make the AK-74M AK-100 series which is something I've said in multiple videos the Arsenal SLR 106s, 107s are not AK-100 series guns. They're actually AK-74, AKS-74 type guns. But that, you know, you can look into it if you're really interested in the details. I just thought this was neat because it's the current Russian military and it's the true military type gun. And the reason we got this and not any of the older ones because the time, by the time these came in, this is what was in production. If the AK Type 3 or the AK 74 had still been in production and use by 2009, which I don't see how they could be, we would have received those. But that's what companies do. They send over semi automatic versions of whatever they're producing for current military contracts, at least most of the time. And in addition to being a nice collectible gun. They're just a lot of fun to shoot. And this is one I still very much shoot today. I don't really see the point in owning something if you don't enjoy it from time to time. And with that, 
we'll move on to our final gun of the day. And again, no surprise, the Vepper FM RPK-74. This is a semi-automatic version of the RPK-74M. Chambered for 545 by 39 as well. And as well, Molot does 762 by 39 versions known as the RPKM or the RPK203. And in 223, 556 NATO as the RPK201. But I wanted this one because, again, it's the Soviet military. And it pretty much underwent the same updates as the AK-74M. The side folding stock from the RPKS, RPKS-74, was made standard. Not as many changes, obviously, because uh, it was already a solid body. But they did change up the mechanism a wee bit. Sorry, this one's a little stiff. Now, instead of needing a bullet tip to... Uh, Fold it. We do have a lever here we can use. That's a major change. Has the cutout now for the scope mount, which is now a standard feature. Synthetic handguards. The barrel is pretty well unchanged. They did go to a slightly different pattern of flash hider, a little bit thinner for the uh, M over the 74. And they went to dimple pressed barrel hardware. The one pe the, I've had people check pictures out on, it seems like the front sights are still pinned on, which would make sense if true, because you still need to unpin the front sight to remove or place your bipod, which I always thought was a bit of a shortcoming, and other nations did too, because like Romania fixed that. But anyway, so from what I know, and I could very well be wrong, the front sight bases were usually pinned on, not dimpled to make that easier. But the rest back here are dimpled. And again, that non-dimpled receiver there, which was common since the late 60s in Russia. Smooth top cover. The larger, newer Molot pistol grip. And to go with it, the new pattern of coffin quad stack mag that holds 60 rounds instead of 45. Still not a drum, but holds more. This is a copy of a Molot made by Puff Gun, but it's a good mag and I enjoyed it and they were quite affordable. And of course since it's an RPK we have to show it on the bipod. And again, monopotting with this mag can be an issue but it is tilt enough to the side not to be. And uh, the reason I wanted this one from the very beginning was much like with the SGO 3194, or 3195 for that matter, same thing. It's a semi-automatic version of what Russia issues as their LMG. Keep in mind that Molot never made the AKM, AK-74. They pretty much stuck to the light machine gun series with the newest one in their inventory being the RPK-16 but uh, most of your Vepper FM's that have come over had the short 16 inch barrel this is one of the very few that they had with the proper 23 and a quarter inch bipod correct military handguards and maybe most noticeably the correct military paddle buttstock because most of your Vepper folders have the tubular style. Again these mags are actually from Puff Gun but are kind of neat. They have a metal tab in the back. They're pretty easy to load and they're made of the same black nylon material. And these take standard 30 and 45 rounders as well. And I know some American companies and whatnot are making drums for 545, but it's not something Russia ever really felt necessary. They did experiment with some models, but yeah. It is a little interesting that the RPK changed quite little from Molot. 
much less than the AK, AKM, AK-74 did from Ishesk, Ishmash. Really with only changes in the muzzle device, bipod collar, how the barrel hardware is held on, and of course the furniture itself. But unfortunately there aren't a ton of these out. And these guns were sanctioned as well. The Kalashnikov Concern Ishmash guns were sanctioned in June of 2014. And the Moloch guns, all of the Vepers, plus all their parts and mags, that was all sanctioned in June of 2017. And with that, we've kind of done a rundown of the standard Russian rifles and light machine guns in the Kalashnikov family. Let's wrap things up. Well, we both made it through another one of these together. Hope you enjoyed the hangout, just kind of looking at the evolution of the AK, AKM, AK-74, and its uh, stable mate, the RPK through RPK-74M. Again, a lot of these, as I've said, there aren't really import versions, unfortunately. So if you want a Russian AK Type 3 or AKM, you're pretty much going to do a kit build. With the newer ones, we do have Segas and Vepers that can be converted over and make very good, authentic replicas, but that's really only for the new stuff. For older guns like the SVT and the SKS, obviously these have come in, but both were kind of soft banned in 1994 because of the bilateral agreement between Russia and the USA, so they're not like up in Canada where they're cheap, but on the other hand, at least ours have 10 round mags, <laughs> not 5. And, uh, yeah, if there's interest, I can do a follow-up looking at the more unique specialized guns like Russia's 9mm AKs and the various Krink clones, maybe even the AK-102, 104, 105, but I think you'll agree this video was plenty longer than some, so had to kind of make a cutting off point somewhere, but it just seemed wrong to do a Romanian collection and not again not get around to the to the Russian <laughs> so why not right guys so what do you think have you done any of these clones or builds anyone else own a legion sorry I really don't have underfolders it I don't know I just never really come across a Russian underfolder kit build or kit that I really cared for and I've got other ones like the Romanian and Polish and Yugo, so it's not like I don't have some underfolders. But, yeah, can't have everything. But yeah, I'd love to hear your opinions, uh, if you've done anything. It's always really fun to share projects we've all done. So let's have a lively conversation down below. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And as soon as it cools off, we'll definitely try to get to the range again. And if you'd like to help support us, help us have more ammo at the range, especially at current ammo prices, please check out the link to our Patreon page. On behalf of Jay, this is Misha, and we will both catch you very soon next time. <laughs>